Hi, and welcome to this Onc Live News Network webinar. Today's discussion will be focused on novel approaches to the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma. I'm your host, Dr. Richard Finn, a clinical professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology Oncology at the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA in Los Angeles, California. Today I'm joined by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Anthony El Kahori, Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at the Keck School of Medicine at USC and Norris Cancer Hospital, also in Los Angeles. During the next 60 minutes, we're going to navigate through some of the questions surrounding how we treat patients with metastatic liver cancer. We'll consider how we are currently using available agents, how they can be sequenced throughout the disease continuum, and how the latest data will help us in making these decisions in our clinics. During the last few minutes of this broadcast, we will answer questions that have been previously submitted by members of our viewing audience. Let's get started. Anthony, it's good to be with you today. Thank you. The area of liver cancer systemic treatment is rapidly changing. You know, if we look back from 2007 to 2017, we only had one drug available. Since that time, we've seen positive phase three data in both frontline and second line with increasing approvals in both those areas. For the first part of our broadcast, let's concentrate on frontline liver cancer. Again, serafinib has been the established standard of care. And in the past year here in the uh, United States, now globally, linvantinib has been approved in the frontline treatment. So before we talk about specifically triaging those two choices, let's step back and talk about how we approach patients with advanced liver cancer. What does advanced liver cancer mean to you? And when you see a patient, what are the, some of the considerations? Right. Thank you, Richard. So yes, I agree with you that advanced liver cancer tends to be a broad group of patients. So let's start from the beginning. These include the patients with liver-limited disease, for example, who have progressed or failed local regional therapies. That could be chemoembolization, Y90, or other options. So that's one category. These are the Barcelona Clinic uh, B patients who have failed local regional therapy. Some of these patients may have actually extensive disease up front that they may be candidates for systemic therapy directly without going through the local regional option. So uh, if we look at phase three trials for advanced disease, about 20% of the accrual tends to be BCLCB patients. Then the more traditional uh, understanding of advanced disease are patients with uh, vascular invasion, usually portal vein invasion, or extrahepatic metastases. So I guess in short, I just want to emphasize that advanced disease includes a group of BCLCCB patients. Okay, that's, uh, that's a lot to consider when approaching the patient, and that also isn't taking into account even the underlying liver dysfunction. How about that? Could you comment on, you know, you have a patient who comes in with a tumor in the liver, and they have vascular invasion, their bilirubin is maybe two and a half, their albumin is three. How do you factor that into your assessment of someone for treatment? Very important consideration. Uh, I frequently tell patients that when we're treating liver cancer, we're really ultimately treating two diseases. The underlying liver cirrhosis or liver disease, uh, as well as the cancer. Uh, to your question, I think frequently patients tend to have some compromise of their underlying liver function. And the patient you've, you've mentioned is someone who has slightly elevated bilirubin, slightly low albumin. So one has to look, I mean, formally, we, one can calculate the CHALPU score. And most of our studies and results come from CHALPU A patients. These, these are the ones who are recruited to phase three trials. We tend to extrapolate and treat CHALPU B patients, but usually these are, quote unquote, the relatively good CHALPU B patients. By good, we mean patients who make it to CHALPU B because of slightly elevated bilirubin or low albumin. But patients who have truly decompensated cirrhosis, requiring paracentesis repeatedly, have active encephalopathy, those patients tend to not do well in general, more likely because of under their underlying liver cirrhosis rather than their cancer. So is it a problem with safety with the drugs we use or treatments, or is it that their underlying liver dysfunction is going to limit their survival? and not their cancer, so to speak? A great question. I mean, I, I think, unfortunately, we don't have adequate safety results for patients with truly decompensated liver cirrhosis. 
we are starting to get some data about safety of, of drugs with child pub so for sorafenib we have registry data we have small phase two data for safety in child pub uh, which generally tells us that it's feasible to treat patients with child pub disease we recently saw data from nivolumab with it in a ch child pub cohort but these were patients with b7 and b8 a child, a child score, and they tended to be patients who don't have active ascites and active encephalopathy. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, from a safety perspective, it's potentially feasible to treat these patients. But I think the more important discussion is that their prognosis is poorer. Child Pew score is a prognostic score, even with, with active cancer. So they tend not to do well in general, and it's a, it's a clinical assessment whether these patients are actually gonna do worse because of their bad cirrhosis or their right. cancer, and prioritizing these two issues and treating accordingly. So that's definitely clinical judgment.